My name is Mike Kane. You can call me Pastor Mike. That's okay with me. I'm still trying to get used to that. I'm still trying to get used to it. But wasn't that worship time? Wasn't that awesome? You know, I really thank you, James, and the whole worship team. The Bible says we enter his courts with praise, right? That's right. And that was just awesome, the way I could just sense the presence of God here. And and it says also he inhabits the praises of his people, right? So that was just an awesome time. Uh, I really enjoyed that. It's good to see so many of you out here tonight on this warm night here. I'll tell you, I'm waiting for winter to start here, folks, but I guess it's not going to come this year. I know most of you like it nice and warm in the winter. That's okay. I'll pray for you guys. I'll pray for you guys. You'll see the light at some point. So, uh, yes, I'm filling in for Pastor Ron. And, uh, oh, you know what? I just realized I forgot something here. Hang on here. I'm hearing an echo out there. Now that I'm a pastor, you know, I can, I can bring my object lesson out here, too. I have my little brown pl- uh, paper bag there. So, anyway, did, were you here last week? Did you, did you hear that message? Knowing God's voice. Knowing God's voice. And when I think about that, I think about the voices of people that I know and how it's distinctive, and I know it. And, and I was thinking about it. Oh, I had to be, I was... Um, working in northwest Connecticut when I got out of college, and uh, I had a friend who lived in Cornwall. Anybody know where Cornwall, Connecticut is? Beautiful town, absolutely beautiful town. But I remember him telling me, and he said, you know, I went to the hardware store, and there's only, of course, one hardware store in Cornwall. And um, he said, I heard this voice, and it was unmistakable. I knew who it was. I didn't even have to see. I knew who it was. And it was Tom Brokaw, Tom Brokaw. Now, how many, some of you younger people are like, who's Tom Brokaw? (laughs) Tom Brokaw lived in Cornwall. And I don't know if he still lives there, but my friend said he knew the voice right away. And I remember when I first moved to this area, back in the mid, I think it was mid-90s, I went into uh, Home Depot and I heard a voice and I said, I I know who that is. And it was Al Terzi. How many of you know Al Terzi? Okay. I think he lives in Southington. I don't know if he still does, but he did then. But I recognized his voice. I recognized his voice. And we're talking about, we're going to continue, this is our second week, talking about recognizing God's voice, knowing God's voice. How many of you want to know God's voice? Don't you? As a believer, we want to know. We want to hear God. We want to have that two-way communication. We want to have that sensitivity to be able to hear God speaking to us. I think every true believer has that desire within them. And the good news is that Jesus died for us and he didn't stay dead, but he's alive forevermore. And he is the only one that could bridge that massive gap between holy God and sinful men. And because of Jesus, because he is alive, we can have this two-way communication with the living God. Amen? Amen. He's the living God. And all good and strong relationships depend on two-way communication. So if we can expect our relationship with God to be everything it needs to be and and everything that can be, we need to know and act upon God's voice. And Pastor Ron said something that was very important last week. He said, There's one way to know whether you can hear or will hear God's voice. And you know what he said? He said, do you expect to hear God's voice? Do you expect? Are you waiting expectantly? Because if you don't think you're going to hear God's voice, guess what? You're not going to hear it. But he said, this is one way to hear God's voice is to expect it. And that's what faith is. Having expectation, believing God will fulfill his promise to communicate with us. And and you know that spending time, we learned last week that spending time with someone, you know, it creates that, that familiarity. We become familiar with them. 
and we learn their ways and we recognize their voice. And how many of you here have, child, have children, right? How many of you know you can recognize, and when, when your kids were young, I know my wife could, she could pinpoint each one of those kids, and wherever they were, she knew, she knew their cry. She knew it. So as any father or mother knows, we want to be able to hear the voice of our child, just like God, our heavenly father, wants to hear us, and we need to hear him. Look with me in John chapter 10 and verse 27. It says this. It says, my sheep, this is Jesus speaking. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. Now, how many of you here would consider yourself Jesus' sheep? Would you consider yourself? How do you become? How do you become a sheep of Jesus? By receiving him as Lord and Savior. We're not saved by what we've done. Nope. We're saved by what Jesus did. And when we receive him, when we recognize our need, because the Bible says, if you think you're, you're good enough, the Bible says all of us, every single one, not one person, none is righteous. All have sinned and come short of God's glorious standard. But the good news is that Jesus went to the cross. He gave his life. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And because he did that, we can know him, and he's alive, and we can have this relationship. And he's the living God, and he wants to speak to us. So it says, Jesus said, my sheep, listen to my voice. We recognize his voice because we are his. We belong to him. And he says, I know them, and they follow me. And part of this whole process of of becoming a Christian is giving up our old life and surrendering to him as our Lord and Savior. He gave his life for us, and in return, we give our life back to him, saying, you gave all to me, I give all to you. That's what it means to be saved, to be born again, to become, a, that's how we become a sheep of Jesus, just like that. He says, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And how many of you know eternal life isn't earned? It's not a reward for the good things we've done. It is a gift. Only God can give eternal life. He says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. Is, this, is that not a reassuring message? Do you believe that today? Yes. Do you believe that? I believe that. Can I ask one of the ushers to get me a water? Is that okay, a bottle of water? Someone back there? Thank you. I'm just going to tell you real quick, I, God, I'll never give up, right? Never giving up. Had a little kidney stone this week, and I'm still battling, so, so Lord, <laughs> just ask right now for a glass of water right here, because that's what the doctor said, keep drinking water. So, if we are new creatures in Christ, we will hear his voice. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. We will hear his voice. We will know his voice. And as believers, we respond. Our response is obedience to his word. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 3. Some of you know this verse. I know you do. It says, this is Jesus talking again. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. Now, he is knocking, believe it or not, on a church's door. That's the picture here. And do you know what that church was? Anybody know? It was the church of Laodicea. Everybody say that with me, Laodicea. And you know what they were known for? Being lukewarm. Lukewarm. Can you picture Jesus having to knock on the door of his own church? He had to knock on the door of his own church. But it says, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. He says, if you hear my voice, this is Jesus speaking, and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together. But it all begins with hearing his voice. The invitation 
to invite him in. And, and this, is, this is part of, you know, so many, you know, I know when I was out, after I was saved and we were, were out street witnessing. And this is a, a, the verse that we used a lot. He said, Jesus stands at the door of your heart knocking. He wants to come in. You have to invite him in. And, and we use this verse in evangelism. But the whole invitation starts with hearing his voice. God desires to speak. A.W. Tozer said, it is God's nature to speak to his children. That is his very nature. And then taking action based on what we hear, we open the door. We invite him in. This is the great invitation. Look what it says in John 18, verse 37. It says, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? And as, as many of you know, this is the story where Jesus was before Pilate. And he was saying that his kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate says, are, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world. That I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So if you're sitting here and you say, I don't hear God's voice. I'm not sensitive to it. Listen to what the, the scripture says. Everyone that is of the truth. And another way to say that, another version says, everyone who seeks truth hears my voice. So there's a few prequalifications to hearing him. You've got to be his sheep. You've got to be his sheep. And you have to seek the truth. If you want to hear God's voice, you have to be a seeker of the truth. And, if we, and the reverse is true also. If we are not seeking the truth, we will not hear his voice. I came across this story that I thought was very apropos for this, this, mess, this point. And the story goes like this. Two old friends who hadn't seen each other for, for years were walking down the street together, renewing old times. Just a minute, said one. I think I hear something. And turning a loose paving stone over, he liberated a cricket, which was chirping merrily away. Why, that's astounding. Of all the people on the street at this hour, hurrying from work, you alone hear the cricket above all, the traffic noises. My friend, said the first, I learned a long time ago that people hear in life only what they want to hear. Now the noise of traffic has neither increased nor decreased in the past few moments. But watch. And as he finished speaking, he let a silver half dollar fall from his pocket to the sidewalk. Immediately, everyone within an amazing large hearing distance stopped and looked around and came running to where they heard the coin drop. If you want to hear from God, guess what? You can hear from God, but it all is a matter of your attitude, your attitude and your desire. And that is the first point I want to make. You've got to want to hear. You've got to want it. You've got to want it to hear from God. Psalm 40 and verse 8 says this, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. This is David, King David. And he's, he's writing this. He says, I take joy in doing your will. Is there something, is there a hobby that you like to do that you take joy? Do you understand what that means, take joy? Receive joy? Enjoy it? Find satisfaction? Fulfillment? David, his passion, his passion was obeying God, serving God, loving God. And I want to ask you this morning, is that your passion? Do you have that same kind of passion, that desire, to, that priority in your life, that you intentionally seek God above all else? Now, how many of you have, have uh, ha passions and and I should say, uh, hobbies, hobbies. Everybody like hobbies? Now, one of my hobbies is uh, skiing. Anybody like to ski? Anybody like to ski? Thus, that's why I like the winter, so I'm a skier, right? 
Well, my son, my oldest son, he, he had a day off yesterday, and he went to Stowe, Vermont. And there may not be snow here, but guess what? There's always snow in Stowe, okay? And he showed this picture of this. He's skiing through deep powder. And I was just thinking, oh, I would love to be there with him. But I take joy in that. So you understand what it means to anything you've done, a hobby, maybe getting together with relatives. You understand what it means to take joy. Well, David said, I take joy, my joy. What brings me greatest satisfaction is doing your will. And if we want to hear from God, we have to make it our priority. And Pastor Ron shared this last week. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 13, it's not up on the screen, but he says, if we will find him, we will find God, if we seek him with all of our heart or wholeheartedly. Remember that? Wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, wholeheartedly. We will find him when we seek him with all of our heart. And let's learn from David and what he says here and what he writes, that I take joy in doing your will. May that be our own testimony Because if we're going to have the relationship that we need to have with God, that we can have with God, we need to hear his voice. And if we want to hear from God, we have to make it our priority. Psalms 84.10 says this, A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. A single day in his courts. In his courts. We enter his courts with thanksgiving. And it says, we've got to want, we, we, we have got to want to spend time with God. Not doing it out of duty, but we have to want to. It has to be our desire. And if there's one thing you can pray for loved ones or children, your kids or, or relatives that don't know the Lord, you know what you want to pray? And I pray this for my kids too, all the time, that God would give them the want to. It's got to be in here. Because if somebody's coming to church... Just out of duty to please someone else, guess what? It's not real. It's not genuine. It says a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. And think about this. If we say we love someone, if we say I love you, but then we say, no, but I don't want to spend time with you, okay? We can, we, you know, words are cheap, right? Words are cheap. Our, our testimony, what we are saying is a false confession. It's a false confession. If we say we want to spend time with God, or we love God, but we don't, we don't make an effort to spend time with him, then that love is awful empty, isn't it? It's a false confession. Genuine love is based on action, and our actions always speak louder than our words. Psalms 37 verse 4 says this, Take delight, in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. What do you take delight in? What do you take delight in? Think about that for a moment. Take delight in the Lord. Delight thyself in the Lord, another version says. Delight thyself. What do you take delight in? And he will give you your heart's desire. The Bible says in his presence there is fullness of joy. And another version for this verse says, make God the utmost delight and pleasure of your life. And when we enjoy someone, isn't it so much easier to listen to them and hear what they're saying? When we enjoy spending time with someone? And let's learn from from David. Let's learn from his example. He was a man after God's own heart, was he not? Right? Don't you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? David, I can guarantee this, he heard God's voice. He knew God's voice. But because he sought it, he made it a priority in his life. Psalms 95, 7 says this, We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. If only we have a choice. And, you know, oftentimes, you know what keeps us from listening to someone or even God? Our pride. Our pride. Say, I don't need it. I'm too busy doing what I got to do. 
And pride can prevent us from hearing from God. Sometimes we can't admit. We don't think we need to hear from God. We're okay on our own. Sometimes we're too busy. I just recently came back from Florida, and my father, who's 86 years old, we recently got him an emergency alert call system. Does anybody know what that is? Okay. And I have an example of that right here. Let's see if I can find it here. Now, I hope this fits over my head. Oh, there we go. Okay, now. Now, the way this works, this is not the same one that I got my dad, but the whole idea is that he fell recently, and it took an hour or so for somebody to get to him to help him, right? But he didn't have this. So we thought, Dad, you know, we, we need to get you something, because he lives by himself. And, uh, you know, he's a little stubborn, I have to admit, you know, a little stubborn. But we said, we're going to get you this, and we, we tried it out with him, right? And he, he, got, the, he got the wrist kind, you know, he got, it's like a wrist, um, you know, it's like a watch, I guess. And it's great, it's even better than this, because when he pushes the button, see this one, when you push the button, see? And I'm thinking to myself, my wife got this to be an example. And I'm like, what good is that going to do like if you're by yourself in the house? But the one we got him, when you push that button, it actually sends a signal to an emergency operator. And then you can hear that operator through um, his uh, answering machine. In his. So we're all excited. Dad, this is a great thing. We tried it out. We're like, hear this. And, you know, he looks at us and he's like, I don't want this. I don't want this. If I got this, I'm admitting failure. I'm not that, I, you know, he's 86, but he's like, I don't want to admit it. He was all down. He was depressed. And, you know, the point to it is this is healing. This is life here. But you have to want to use it. You have to want to. It's no good if you don't press the button, right? You have to admit your need. Admit your willingness to hear, to hear that voice on the other. And this, you know, this young lady was very nice, and she said, may I help? Oh, yes, we're trying out the system. Oh, that's great. Well, just so you know, and we'll call the ambulance if you need it. And my dad's a little humpy, you know, Irishman. And so anyway, we can finally convince them that it's okay, Dad. It's okay. This is something that's a good thing. But that made me think that, you know, we have to want to hear from God. We have to, it's, it's available to us. It's available. And just because maybe we don't hear from God doesn't mean he's not speaking to us. He's not speaking to us. Psalms 37, 7 says this. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait impatiently for him to act. Have you ever waited impatiently? My kids do this all the time. They're like, oh, come on, you know, let's go. I got to go, come on, right? And I, I've done that. I admit, I've been, you know, impatient. You know, maybe at a light, the person in front, it's green. I'm like, it's not going to get any greener. They're not moving yet. Has anybody done that except me? It says, be still in the presence of the Lord. Be still. And in this day and age, is it not tough to be still and to wait patiently for him to act? And I think another reason that prevents us from hearing God is that we're not patient. We're not patient. We've not learned to wait on him. And as followers of Christ, we need to learn to wait on him. How many of you know patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, is it not? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's nine of them. And it says, against such there is no law, meaning you can't have enough. You, there's, you can never have too much patience, right? You can never have too much patience. 
Against such there is no law. So we need to learn to wait patiently. If we're going to hear God's voice, we need to be, find a... And you know, how many... I don't have a mountain in my... I know I love Pastor Ron, but I don't have a mountain in my backyard. I don't. Now listen, I've been on top of plenty of mountains in New England. Plenty, and I love it. I love that experience and the view and, and the, the, everything about it. I love it, and I agree. You can, you, it's, it's a great way to communicate with God. It is. It's true, but... But I don't have, but guess what? You don't need a mountain to hear God's voice. I have been brought to tears driving my truck, and I got no radio on nothing, just thinking, dwelling on the goodness of God. You can, God can communicate to you. You don't have to be on a mountain. You can be in your truck driving on your way to work in the morning. Psalms 34 4 says this I prayed to the Lord. And he answered me, and he freed me from all my fears. And it all starts with seeking God. And there's a sequence. We pray, he answers, and deliverance comes. And God's answer doesn't come if we're too busy to to make time for him, or if we're too proud to admit our need, or if we aren't patient. So these are some things that can prevent us from hearing his voice. And it says, I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. And have you ever sent a text or or an email, and you're waiting for that answer? And it's somebody that you know, and you're like, you're waiting for that answer, and you're waiting, and it's kind of frustrating, and you're like thinking, are they mad at me? Did I do something wrong? Have you ever been frustrated when you don't get an answer right away? But the good news right here is that when we pray to the Lord, he always has time for us. And he always answers us. This is a promise from his word. So the first point in wanting to hear and know God's voice and hear his voice is you've got to want it. You've got to seek God. He's got to become a priority in your life and my life. And number two, how many of you know we have a choice? We have a choice on what we listen to. Do we not? We have a choice. God gives us a choice. And is there not <laughs> enough talk shows and you know blogs and everybody's got an opinion, right? Everybody's got an opinion at work, in our families, and it matters who we listen to. Listen to what it says here in Genesis 3 and verse 1. It says this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And how many of you are familiar with this story? Right? This is the fall. And how many of you know that we have an enemy who seeks us, seeks to steal? He's a thief, right? That steal, seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's the enemy of our soul. And how many of you think that he can speak to us? How many of you think that he can suggest things to us? Yeah? And doesn't he twist the truth by suggesting God? He paints this picture like, you know what, did God really say that? He plants a doubt in Eve's heart. He plants a doubt. Did God really say? And as believers, we need to be well-versed in God's word. We need to have it written in our heart. We need to have a ready, strong reservoir of his word in our heart so we know we can, we can discern between God's voice and the voice of our enemy. Genesis, uh, the second verse there in chapter 3 says this, and this is Eve speaking. Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Now that's almost exactly what God said, but she added something. You know what she said? She said, or even touch it. 
And as I thought about that, I believe that that little doubt that Satan put in her heart, she was starting to believe it, and she added to what God had said. Because God said, you may eat freely from the, from the fruit, the fruit of the trees in the garden, except the tree in the middle of the garden, because when you eat it, you will die. That's what God said. So the question is, who are we listening to? Who are we listening to? We need to test what we hear against the truth of God's word. Not adding or taking away from the true meaning. Genesis 3 and verse 4 says this. And this is the enemy of our soul. He says, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. You won't die. Can you hear it? You won't die. You won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So Satan tries to present God here in a negative light, that God has ulterior motives. He doesn't have pure motives. He wants to restrict you, Eve, and that's really what God's motive is, and that's not true. That's not true, but that's what Satan was telling Eve. Verse 6 says, the woman was convinced. And that word means persuaded. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. And it appealed to her pride, her sense of pride. I wanted to be, that was how Satan fell because he wanted to be like God. So she took some of the fruit and ate it And then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. She believed the deception. And who and what she believed resulted in her actions. So we have to be careful what we're listening to. How many, I've heard Pastor Ron say this dozens of times, what goes in the ear gate and the eye gate goes into the heart, right? So we have to be careful who we're listening to, what we're listening to, because what we believe, what we listen to, can become what we believe, and what we believe can determine our actions. God said, if you eat it, you will die. Satan said, if you eat it, you will become like God. And who was, who was correct? Who was true? God was. And, and from that point, that sin entered the world. So listening to Satan instead of God resulted in the fall. So does it not matter who we listen to? It matters who we're listening to and what we're listening to. John 10, verse 4 says this. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. And as we get familiar, as we spend time with God and his word, having a, how many of you have a quiet time every day? How important is your quiet time? Amen? That's the time when we can spend time getting familiar with the truth. I'm familiar with the one that loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we could have eternal life. And how, do you know that government agents... When they're being trained to determine the difference between true currency and counterfeit money, you know what they do? They spend a lot of time with that real, the real thing. They spend a lot of time feeling it, smelling it, touching it, examining it, getting to know the real thing so that when they see the counterfeit, they can recognize it right away. And that's how you and I become familiar with God's voice, by spending time with him and making sure that we're listening to him and we're not listening to someone else. So my next object lesson. Everybody see what this is right here? Now, me and this, this is, do everybody know what this is right here? 
Anybody know? Can they see that? that? You know what that is? That's a ketchup packet from Burger King. That's what that is right there. That's what that is. Okay? And you know what? Me and this ketchup packet, we are really good friends. We spend a lot of time together. We know each other. We're familiar with each other. So familiar, in fact, that how many of you believe that this ketchup packet will only listen to me because we're that good of friends? Only. Do you believe that? Watch this, okay? Do you, does anybody believe that I can make this ketchup packet do whatever I say? Okay? Mr. Ketchup, I want you to go down. Mr. Ketchup, I want you to go up. Mr. Ketchup, go down. Stop. Go up. See, we're such good friends that he will only listen to me. So I want you, and to prove this, I, want, I need a volunteer to come on up here. Need a volunteer. Anybody? Who wants to volunteer? Alan, I see you raising your hand over there. Come on, Alan. Come on up. It's my friend, Alan. Bonifant. Everybody give Alan a hand. Come on up here, buddy. Now, do you think you can make, and just turn around so everybody can see you here. Okay, we'll go here. Okay, we'll do that. Turn around so everybody can see you. Okay. Do you think that you can tell, you can make this ketchup packet do whatever you say? Do you think so? Why don't you try it? Try it. Ketchup go down. Try a little harder. <laughs> try a little harder. Yell, yell a little louder. Maybe it didn't hear you. Ketchup go down. Try it again. Go down. It's not listening to you, buddy. <laughs> I know. Not listening. Go down. No. See, it doesn't listen. Because me and this ketchup, we're such good friends, it only listens to me. You want, want me to show you? Watch this. Ketchup, go down. Pretty good, huh? That's how good friends we are. Ketchup, go up. Isn't that great? You want to try it again? Try it again. Go ahead. Good. Do, do the best you can. Ketchup, go down. It's not listening to you, man. It's not going to listen. Doesn't recognize your voice, Alan. Doesn't recognize your voice. <clears throat> Only me, right? Catch up, go down. Go down, catch up, go down. See that? Catch up, go up. <clears throat> How do you like that? Isn't that awesome? Me and this catch up are such good friends. It only listens to me. Everybody give Alan a hand. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now the point... Is the point is we need to be listening for God's voice, amen. So many of us we want advice on what to do, where to go. And I admit, sometimes I run to people wanting advice, but we need to hear God's voice, amen. It says, Jesus. In John chapter 10 says, after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. He leads them. He is the, he is the good shepherd, is he not? And they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Psalms 1 says this in verse 1. Oh, the joys, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of of the wicked. And are there, unfortunately, are there wicked people out there that might want to give us advice? Yep. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. It matters who you're listening to because what you're listening to and who you're listening to gets into your heart. And when it gets into your heart, it becomes what you believe. And what you believe determines your actions. It says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Or stand around with sinners. Or join in with mockers. Verse 2. But they delight in the law of the Lord. Meditating on it day and night. 
And they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. And how many of you want to prosper in all you do? I want to prosper in everything I do. But they delight. They delight in the law of the Lord. And may you and I, and I pray tonight, that we would all have a holy desire for God's word and hearing God because God's will will never contradict God's word. How many of you know that? God's will will never contradict his word. Oh, the joys of those who who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating day and night. It matters who and what we're listening to. And my third point is this. There's a difference. How many of you know? Between hearing and listening, and listening and obeying. So it's a process. How many of you have ever been in a room and your wife or your spouse has been talking to you for maybe five, ten minutes? And you're, yep, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Haven't heard a word she said. Has that ever happened to anybody but me? Okay? Happened to me last night as I was trying to study. I said, yes, she's, she's trying to tell me. I'm, yep, yep, yep. She said, did you hear what I said? I said, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> and how often do we give the impression of listening when we're completely preoccupied with something else, right? At home, at work, on the phone sometimes. Yes, uh-huh, yes, mm-hmm. 1 Samuel 15, says this. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Obedience requires listening to his voice. And as we listen, it gets into our heart, and when it becomes, gets into our heart, it becomes what we believe. And as a parent, How do we feel when our kids don't listen to us? We told them something and they're not listening, right? It brings conflict, right? There's tension in the relationship. We feel disrespected. And it's the same way with God when he's told us something and we're not obedient to what he's saying. And obedience always results in a stronger relationship. James 1, verse 22 says this, Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. And if that, has that ever happened to you? I mean... Right? Have you ever, <laughs> oh, there's a pimple right there. I see it. But then all of a sudden you have a thought and you're thinking about something else and you go on your way. Or there's a, there's a piece of shaving cream, or there's a little shaving cream in your ear, right? That's happened to me many times. Somebody goes to work and they, they by the way, you, have, you know, a little shaving cream there. But it's like listening is not enough. Listening. We need to not only listen, not only hear, Listening is more active, hearing. Listening is is hearing with intent. But then we need to obey what we're hearing. And it says we're fooling ourselves if we, you know, if we give the pretense of, of, of listening to God, but we don't take action on what we hear. We're faking it, pretending. We're going through the motions, letting it go in one ear and out the other. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 4 says this. You are to follow only God, your God. Hold him in deep reverence. Keep his commandments. Listen obediently to what he says. Serve him and hold on to him for dear life. And have you ever held on to something for dear life? Does anybody have had an experience like that? I, I remember I did. I held on, I was on the back of a motorcycle Fresh or sophomore year, I think, when I was at UConn. And we we're going down 195 from stores into Willimantic. 
and there's an intersection there. And it's Browns Road. I mean, I used to work there. And I, we're going down, and all of a sudden, this car pulls out of Browns Road, doesn't even see us. And I was on the back. There was two other, my friend was driving a motorcycle. I was on the back. And when I saw it, I saw it, it was going to happen. I held on to him. I was, he said I, he thought I was going to break his ribs. And that didn't even work. I actually catapulted me off the motorcycle. And I did a somersault right in the middle of one, Route 195, Mansfield, Connecticut. But I was holding on for dear life. Thank God I had just scrapes. I had no major injuries, thank God. But have you ever had that experience like you're holding on for dear life with everything you have? It says here, hold on to him. Listen obediently to what he says. Serve him. Hold on to him for dear life. And I want you to do something for me this week. Take your, your uh, challenge, weekly challenge. Take your weekly challenge. I want you to do something for me. And I want you to do this. <clears throat> During your quiet, how many of you have a quiet time? Okay, almost everybody. During your quiet time, I want you to do this for me. I want you to ask God, let it get real quiet. Ask God a question. I'll give you some ideas, okay, suggestions. Say, God, is there anything you want to say to me? God, is there something I need to know before I start my day? Are you expecting to hear from God? God, is there someone you want me to speak to today? Maybe at work. I've worked with him for 20 years, but I never, I never said a word that I, I love Jesus. Never. But maybe today's the day. Is there someone you want to, me to encourage to offer help, to speak life to. Remember that? Speak life? Right? How about this? God, is there someone that I need to make things right with? Do you dare ask God that question? I want you to ask God a question in your quiet time. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to write down the answer he tells you. I want you to write down the answer. You don't have to share it with anyone, okay? But that's your challenge this week. God wants to speak to us. And maybe because we don't hear his voice doesn't mean he's not trying to communicate with us. Sometimes we're the biggest roadblock to hearing from God. We cling to him. It says right here in Deuteronomy, listen obediently to what he says. Serve him, hold on to him for dear life. And in that same chapter, De Deuteronomy 13, 18, it says this, the Lord your God will be merciful only if you listen to his voice. How many of you want God's mercy? I need it every day. It's conditional here. If we hear or if we listen to his voice and keep all his commands, and oftentimes the difference between hearing and not hearing his voice is our own attitude, our own attitude. We have to want to. We have to be careful who we're listening to. And then it's not a matter of just listening or hearing. It's a matter of obeying. That's when we really are experiencing that, that abundant life that Christ died to give us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you are so willing to speak to us. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here tonight in the sanctuary who may be listening online, who may be downstairs, wherever they may be. Father, I pray that in each one of their hearts and my heart, you would put that want to, that desire, that passion, that hunger, that thirst for God, to hear God's voice, just like we sang about at the beginning, to hearing him sing over us. There's no greater joy than hearing 
Your voice, God, you desire to speak to us. But sometimes it's our own pride or our own busyness that gets in the way. God, forgive us and help us to, to in, our, in this busy, you know, um, fast food, can't wait a minute life and world and society that we're in. Father, help us to slow down, to be still in your presence and to wait patiently for you to act. Father, that is my prayer for my brothers and sisters here. I ask you to meet everyone at their point of need, wherever they might be right now, Father. Meet them. Father, draw them to yourself, God. And may they experience that life, that abundant life that Christ died to give us, to allow us to experience that abundant life. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.